This morning, friends, we are going to go on a magical carpet ride into the unknown, to glimpse beyond the net curtain, to step into the world of revelation, to boldly go where no man has gone before, without the necessary task of seeking out new life and new civilization. For today, rather, we are going to sneakily peek through the portal to poke a cheeky nose into the opaque future. That's this week. Next week, something entirely inexplicable. If you are following me so far, I'm talking, my friends, about that mysterious foreign country, that future that awaits us through the clouds, that final frontier, that destination which we trust our train of faith is taking us to the terminus of our journey with Jesus. I mean, of course, heaven. Heaven. Many famous singers and songwriters have sung and written in that order about that faraway land called heaven, and also Belinda Carlisle. Ms. Carlisle, but I'm not sure if she was a Ms. or a more feminine Miss or Mrs., sang words which spoke to a whole generation. Ooh, baby, do you know what that's worth? Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. They say in heaven love comes first. We'll make heaven a place on earth. Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. A lovely song, we would all agree, which tragically, tragically makes very little sense. For heaven, friends, is sadly not a place on earth, because I have checked thoroughly on the internet. It appears to me, and I'm no expert in computing or geography, or indeed any of the sciences, that Ms. Carlyle may, in fact, have meant that Devon is a place on earth, which I think you'll find is more anatomically correct. Ooh, Devon is a place on earth. Indeed, North Piddle is also a place on earth. And Backside is a place on earth in Scotland, if that counts. There are many other amusing places on earth, such as Colchester. But heaven is not a place on earth. Some of you who are still looking vaguely attentive, which may only be a few, but substantially more than normal this far into a sermon, will have noticed my playful aside earlier that we are going to explore somewhere that no man has gone before. This, of course, is not true, for we do know of one who has gone ahead of us and tells us quite biblically in John 14 verse 2, In my father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Friends, one of my biggest concerns about heaven is that when I get there, that is a travel inn or some other budgetary hotel. When Jesus tells us that in his father's house there are many rooms, I have a passing dread of arriving and sent Peter asking me if I am aware of the good night guarantee, and then having to find my room, which will seemingly be as far away from the reception as it is humanly possible to get. Heaven has to be better than that, doesn't it? That's not anything against a Premier Lodge or a Holiday Plaza. These places are excellent for us on this old earth. But I really do hope that in the Kingdom of God, Jesus isn't forewarning us that that's what we've got to look forward to. Of course, these places are perfectly bearable, as long as there's nobody in the room to your left or your right, or above or below or indeed in the same hotel as you, because that's when the trouble starts. But not at a reasonable hour, when you're feeling quite tolerant, no indeed. It rather seems to me that every other guest seems to feel the need to stomp back to their room at about 1am 
slam every door and drawer they can find, put the TV on loudly and watch MTV Tube or Facebook and then perform what sounds like an impressive gymnastic routine across the floor of their room. And that's tolerable here on Earth because you're only there for one night. But in heaven, friends, you are there for eternity. And I am sure that the angels would have a sweepstake on how long it would actually take before someone from Britain complained. And when they do complain, after 40,000 years, whether they start their complaint with the word, sorry. Sorry, I want to complain about the people in the room next to me. My other worry, if heaven is like a value hotel chain, is what to have for breakfast. On this earth, on day one in a hotel, you ordinarily choose the full cooked option. Why not? You don't get full English breakfast at home, you're paying for it, so why not take advantage of it? And it's a buffet, all you can eat, so you do. Bacon, egg, sausage, tomatoes, mushrooms, beans, hash browns, toast, black pudding, which you're just going to leave on the plate because you don't like it, fried bread, more eggs, sausage, beans, then cereal. It's rude not to. Full fat milk is a treat after all. Toast and jam, pomegranate juice. You'd never buy it in the shops, but it's worth a try because it's healthy. Healthy is good. Croissants with jam. Buns. Why are there buns here? Never mind, buns, yoghurt. Don't normally have a pot of raspberry yoghurt at this time of day. Slightly continental, but it makes them for a nice pudding after all that grease. Day two. You can't quite face all that you add on day one, so you go for porridge. Day three, you have a bowl of all bran and a slice of toast. But what about heaven? A dilemma every day. Full English, porridge or a bowl of all bran. Forever. I'm just slightly nervous about the whole full English thing in heaven anyway, truth be told. Sausage, bacon, made from animals. But we know in Isaiah the idea of the wolf living with the lamb, the leopard laying down with a baby goat, and the calf and the lion playing together. The implication is that there is no eating animals, no carnivorousness. Entirely vegetarian, maybe even vegan. That is a worry, a life devoid of steak and kidney pudding and custard. But it's a worry I would live with because I would have the whole of eternity to play with the toaster. The special hotel toaster that you never see in anybody's house or even Argus or DFS. The utterly wasteful, always on toaster. The one with a conveyor belt, where you put your bread on, then go back and pack your room, while the bread embarks on its slow journey of transformation. I would love to have a toaster like that. A hint I have frequently made to Sandra as Christmas approaches or my birthday, or Pentecost. I would relish the challenge of trying to get it to successfully make cheese on toast. And that, friends, is why I need an eternity in heaven. That's a slight flaw with any electric toaster, isn't it, in fairness? It's, time, it's fine for making toast, but no good for making cheese on toast. Of course, with a standard pop-up toaster, there is a cheat available, which I have thought of all by myself. You make the toast as normal, pop. A bit of buttery cheese, sliced or grated, your choice. And then you rest 
the toaster on its side so that the cheesy toast goes in horizontally. Ah, bordering on genius. Then you depress the plunger and you just wait until it pops and launches your cheese on toast across the room. Another fundamental question about heaven which taxes the greatest human minds is as follows. Will I see my Tiddles again in heaven? Tiddles is, of course, a deceased pet, be it a cat, dog, Burmese python, Russian hamster, or a Welsh rarebit. Do animals have a soul? Do animals go to heaven? And does it boil down to whether an animal was good or bad on earth? But good or bad for an animal is tricky. A dog sits when instructed, he is a good dog. He chews a table leg, he is a bad dog. But he's just a dog. He may ignore every instruction we give him through ignorance, through weakness, through his own deliberate fault. But that doesn't make him an evil dog capable of constructing an industrial base of evil in a hollowed out volcano, whether he be a bad dog like Muttley or a good dog like Danger Mouse. Can a dog really be evil? Can a wasp be evil? Can an ant be evil? Can a weevil be evil? You know those tiny red spider things that we find on window ledges in summer. Can they be evil? Pigeons? Rats? General vermin? Starlings? The point is this, friends, that if Tiddles gets into heaven by default, then logically every single ant, termite, centipede, moth, pigeon, rat and woodlouse that has ever lived will be there as well, as long as it has been inherently good. That doesn't sound right, friends. You'd think that an infestation like that would have been mentioned somewhere in the book of Revelation, or Jesus might have given us a bit of a clue in his speech about his father's house. There are many rooms in my father's house, and I go to fumigate a place for you. There are no moths in heaven. Jesus tells us this in Matthew 6 verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. There are no moths in heaven, nor thieves, nor thieving moths. Furthermore, there is no rust in heaven, and therefore there is no wax oil. You could conceivably still have Austin Metros or Morris Marinas in heaven. Or perhaps there is no rust because heaven is full of Robin Reliance made of fiberglass. I have a perfectly biblical theory. Any animal can get into heaven if they have faith in God through Jesus, just like their owners. That's what we're promised in John 3, verse 16. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is no reason why this should exclude animals. Thus, if you are really keen on seeing Tiddles or Fido or Smudge or Zebedee or your mother-in-law in heaven, then you have to bring them to faith in Christ. You have a goldfish. You love your goldfish. You cannot bear the thought of an afterlife without your goldfish. Then do as follows. Pray for your goldfish. Preach to your goldfish. Baptise your goldfish. Total immersion should be easy enough. Anoint your goldfish with oil. Maybe some olive oil. Balsamic vinegar, a bit of salt, heaven. You see, it doesn't really make sense that Tiddles makes it to heaven, but a hulking great Tyrannosaurus won't. Both may be warmly welcomed into heaven if they have faith in Christ. 
the Tyrannosaurus who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. That will make heaven fun. In conclusion, friends, we do not know for certain what heaven is like. It may be like a Teletubby-style meadow, or it might be a premier lodge with a Christian dinosaur growling hymns of praise. There is no rust in heaven, which implies that there is either no ferrous metal, or no rain, or that chemistry is utterly different to earth. And we rejoice in this because we have an eternity to learn it. Heaven, unlike Belinda Carlyle, is not a place on earth. But rather, in the words of Rolf Harris, there's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold. And she's buying a stairway to heaven. Christians, we cannot know for certain what heaven is like. But as Sir Rolf notes, ooh, it makes me wonder. And that uncertainty is all part of the journey of faith we are on, the stepping into the unknown. But Jesus has gone before us and assures us that he is currently preparing our rooms. Pray that there will be complimentary tea, coffee and biscuits. Amen. <laughs>